So, um, kids, it's good to have you guys in with us. Super stoked that you're here. Um, oh, that was pathetic. Man, it is good to have the kids in with us today. Yeah, that's the right response. That's the right response. It's always a big Sunday. And for those of you who don't know, um, and if you haven't been a part of Praise, and you walked in this morning getting ready to drop your kids off, and you were like, wait, 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 I can't drop my kids off um, for Kids Church, just so you know what this is about. Every fifth Sunday, so every, every month that has five Sundays in it, which happens four times a year, we get the entire church together in this room. So that we bring the kids' church in along with us. And um, in some ways, that may be for you an inconvenience. I don't care. Um, no. Um, really, truly, uh, there are so many benefits that outweigh the costs. Um, and even this last Wednesday, we got together as pastors and we were talking about this and having a discussion and Pastor Dylan brought up the question of let, let's remind ourselves, or the point of let's remind ourselves why we do Family Sunday, which is why he's an incredible associate pastor, by the way, is he brought it back to that important point, which is why we do what we do with Family Sunday. And the reason why we do this is because Jesus never distinguished that there was the church of today and the church of tomorrow. He never said you're a part of the church when you hit a certain age. How many of you guys have watched The Chosen? Yeah? Yeah, that show is terrible. No, I'm just kidding. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. I actually, one of the things I loved about that show, I mean, because I do love it, and we were watching it together as a family. One of the things I love about it is early on when Jesus is together with the kiddos. You know what I'm saying? Remember that? It's almost like the first disciples were kids in the show. And, you know, I'm not, it's not biblical or, you know, a part of Scripture, you don't see that. But what I do see is that picture very clearly in Scripture. That for Jesus, there are some things about our faith that we ought to look at our kids and find in their faith and see in ourselves. And there are some things as adults that our kids ought to see as we worship, as we glorify God, that helps set the example for them. And truly, even as Pastor Ashton was bringing the story of Passover into, as we talk about communion, it's all a part of it, right? That is a part of it. And, and very much that was something that was to be handed in family down from parents to kids. And so there's something so important about what we're doing today. And so in spite of the fact that it might end up being a little bit louder today in here, and there might be some squirming, and your kids might be squirming next to you, that's okay. And if you're, you're, you don't have kids next to you, but you got kids behind you, and they're squirming, or in front of you, and they're squirming, can I just say to you, it's good. It's the sound of life. And if we didn't have that sound at praise, that would be a disaster. And so it is good for us to have the sound of life within this church. And so if there's a little extra noise today, if there's a little bit of squirming today, it's okay. And kids, I want to say to you um, something very specific. If I start to drone on and on and on and on and on and on and on, and I keep talking and you get bored, take your Bible and open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and just start reading. And read and read and read. Because when I was a kid, I was in a church, and the pastor droned on and on and on. And I just started reading in 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I didn't even accept Jesus Christ until a decade later. And all those things that I had read, the Holy Spirit took and brought back to my remembrance. When I had accepted Christ, it was like all of a sudden, all those things made sense. He brought it all back. And you may have already accepted Christ, but the beautiful thing about this right here is the promise that this is unlike any other book, and that the power of the Holy Spirit attends to these words, and not one of them, once you read them, will return without doing something. So, just open it up, start reading, if I get boring. Okay? Speaking of boring, I am a little concerned. I am a little concerned that, um, you know, having gone to Israel, which I'm going to totally name drop uh, in every sermon from here on out, um, <laughs> that having gone to Israel, that you guys are going to start getting bored when I say, you know, when we went to Israel, 
It kind of reminds me of when I was a kid and my aunt and my uncle would come over and they would have the slideshow from their recent vacation. And we were sitting, you probably had a floral print couch, but this was the 80s. And for us, we had the browned print couch, which had some sort of wagons slash haystacks or something on it. How many of you remember that couch? Anybody else? Say, yeah, 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 yeah. And I remember sitting on that couch and just, and I don't know these places. And I'm so bored out of my mind. So I'm concerned about that, but I don't really care because I went to Israel. And uh, <laughs> one of the things I, I, I thought was so interesting when we went was the very first day we went to Caesarea, right? And it's so interesting because here in the U.S., we just don't have the history that they've got there. When we went to Europe and we're looking at these buildings, we're like, these buildings are older than the United States. And when we were in Israel, I was like, these buildings are older than Europe. I mean, like thousands, literally millennia of history in this place. And what's so interesting is for them, it's just kind of a part of their daily life. So, so the very first day we go to Caesarea, which is where Paul was held before he was sent off to Rome. And, and um, we're sitting there talking and everybody's talking and talking and talking. And I'm just staring at these just columns that are kind of laid in the dirt. And they're beautiful columns, pink and white and all these just gorgeous columns. And I'm like, are those real? Like, because they're just laying there and we're all listening to our guide or one of our guides and we're all just sitting there and some people are like leaning up against them and some people are actually sitting on them. And I'm like, so I, I go to our Jewish guide and I said, are those real? Like, are those a part of this dig? And he looks at me like I'm dumb, which he had a point because that is a dumb question. And he goes, where else would they be from? And I said, but should we just be like sitting on them and leaning up against them? And he goes, and, and I said like, oh, that's not what I said. I said, should they be there just kind of in the dirt laying there for us to kind of be all around? And he goes, where else would they be? <laughs> but in the U.S., if we had something like that with columns that were 2,000 years old, they'd be behind glass. You know what I'm saying? Like you wouldn't get to go up and sit on them and sit, be around them. But that is just a part of, for them, the, the history is so a part of their life that it's all kind of interweaved be, uh, together. So like another kind of situation or way that you could see this was we were just driving down the road, right? And our guide goes, now on your right, you'll see Tel Megiddo. And we're just like, wait, what? what, what? Like he says, that's just a tell. Tell T-E-L, which just means a hill, but not just an ordinary hill. A tell is, let's say 4,000, 5,000 years ago, somebody builds a city. Somebody else comes along and destroys it. And then someone else comes and builds a city right on top of that city's rubble. And then somebody else comes along and destroys it. And then someone comes along and builds a city on top of that, and someone destroys it. And then someone else builds it. And by the time you get to today, there are these hills that you can tell are unnatural. You can see that there's something unnatural about it, but that this is undug. Like there's no archaeology that has happened there yet. But the whole point of archaeology then is to dig through layer after layer of this cake of history that you see. But what was striking to me was... As we're driving and we see one of these, uh, it was Beth Shan, which shows up in the Bible. And he just quickly says, yeah, that's tell Beth Shan, most likely. And we just keep driving. And all around this historically significant place, there's just a neighborhood. And people are living around it and kids are playing around it. It's just all integrated in the daily life for them. And for us, if there was something like that here, we would dig that sucker up and then we would build an amusement park around it and there would be water rides going through it. That's what we would do in the U.S. And for them, it's all kind of interweaved. And, and what was so interesting was our guide was just telling us as he was talking about all of this history that for them, it is such an anchoring experience. And, and without sharing too much about his story, but because of 
the family history through the Holocaust, they don't know generations in the past for their family. But what he does know is that his people were here in this land 3,000, 3,500 years ago, 4,000, 5,000 years ago, this land was promised to them. And this land is something that they're a part of. And for them, he said, because he wasn't a believer, um, and I'm not even sure, I, I, from what I picked up, I don't think he was a practicing Jew either. So, but as he was talking about it, it was an anchoring experience for him. Because they knew this is the land. And as they read even scripture, and Old Testament and New Testament, this is their people's history. And it anchors them. And that's important. Because you live in a world that makes no sense. You live in a world where you are told things that are the dumbest things you could ever imagine. And you are told that and force-fed that on a daily basis. And so right now, more than maybe any time in a long time, there is a, an awakening hunger. Somebody sent me a study just this week. An awakening hunger for deep spiritual history and, and spiritual things. Because nothing makes sense anymore. So there is this awakening of hunger and thirst after spiritual things. We want to be anchored in something that goes back. For us, for you and for me, we have an anchor that is more than just a history of our people. We have something more. And scripture actually talks about this in Psalm 92. So grab your Bibles if you would. Open them up to Psalm 92. While you're turning there, um, we're just going to read the last few verses of it. Psalm 92. Um, There's an interesting experience that happens to me every now and then when I'm just out shopping or doing something. And uh, it's interesting how often this happens. Somebody will recognize me. And they'll say, where do I know you from? And that, you probably had this happen to you as well. Where do I know you from? And so then we start the, yeah, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not entirely sure. And then we start asking each other questions to try to figure out how we would come in proximity with one another. But sometimes they put my face on the sign out there. And, and I keep thinking, why would you want to put my face on the sign out there? But, I mean, I guess I keep telling them too. So that's probably part of it. But... So I'm like, maybe they were driving by, and I, I know that that's probably a possibility. But, but what's interesting is how many times we'll get to the point where I go, so where do you go to church, or are you a part of a church anywhere? And what's so interesting is when they say, oh, yeah, I, I'm a part of Praise Assembly. Do you go there too? <laughs> yeah? Yeah, I, I sure do. Um... When was the last time you were there? Oh, I don't know, a couple years on Easter. That's always the answer. It was a couple years ago on Easter. And that's the point at which I go, "Mm, hmm, so you're a part of praise, huh? Because there's a difference between attending and being a part. There is. There's a difference between showing up and being in. And... And the thing is that right now there's this really unfortunate, especially as you see this hunger, like really growing up for something deeper and more lasting and with, with more teeth to it than the, than the zeitgeist of the moment, right? Like the, the, the emotions and thoughts of the moment, but looking for something that in the church you also have this idea or a really unfortunate understanding that you don't have to be in a church to be a part of the church. That it's okay for you to just kind of do your own thing and believe in Jesus Christ. Here's what's so interesting to me. When Peter, very first time, confessed Jesus Christ as the Son of God, he says, you are the Christ. You are the Son of God. What were the very first words out of Jesus' mouth? It's about the church. As soon as he confesses Jesus Christ as Lord, Jesus starts talking about the church. 
the moment you accept Jesus Christ as Lord, you ought to get plugged in to a church. Period. When God moves in your life, he expects you to make a move as well. And there's a difference between attending and being a part. And uh, I was talking to um, Nick Koth, um, who he and Lauren are getting ready to expect. They're expecting a, a girl now, which is very exciting. But they um, shared on a Sunday morning here, and I was talking to them about what they feel called to. They feel called, they work at MSU, to help kids who are maybe grew up in church or maybe they didn't. But when they go off to school, often what happens is, oh, often what happens is, that's my church, right? And then you go off to a strange place, Springfield, Missouri, and you get there, and you're only there for a brief period. And boy, while you're there, like, you keep remembering the way things were. And it's easy sometimes during those three, four years to not get plugged in. Because that's not your church. Your church is here. And I understand that. But there are patterns that you set in that age when you have moved out of your home that you grew up in that will last for the rest of your life. And I have time and time again talked to seniors at Evangel or elsewhere who never got plugged into a church during their time at that school. And then they're getting ready to go out into ministry. And they never got anywhere and became a part of what God was doing in a local church. And at that point, they're like, man, I got I to gotta be involved. And I said, well, you probably should have started three years ago. And, and friends, it doesn't just happen with school. I've seen the exact same thing happen with people come to the national office of the Assemblies of God. And they have a home church that was their church. And now they're in Springfield, Missouri. And they don't ever get plugged in and be a part of a church. There are patterns in our lives that over time can get solidified. And this scripture talks about the importance of not just attending. There's a difference between attendance and being a part. And that's what this passage talks about. Psalm 92, verse 12. Here's what it says. The righteous flourish like the palm tree and grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Is anybody in here like dates. You're looking for a date. If you do. <laughs> that was a great opportunity. You should have held that hand up higher. Others could be looking around. This could be a whole thing that we start here. Praise. If you're looking for a date, please stand. Um, no, 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 not those kind of dates. Um, the, the, the dates that are the fruit. One of the, one of the interesting things, when I was in Israel, um, one of the interesting things was not just the ancient history, because there's some really important things that have happened in Israel in the last 70 years that are kind of a big deal, that impact the whole world, okay? So, but one of the things that was interesting was, as we were driving, that same trip, when he said, oh yeah, on the right, you got Beth Shan, and I'm like, wait, 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 what? A little later, he goes, now on the right, you're going to see a field, and that's an important field. He said, there it is. He said, did you see those date trees there? And really, all throughout Israel, there are date palm trees everywhere. The palm trees there are date palm trees, okay? So you see these things everywhere. What's amazing is how they've capitalized on every bit of land and the amount of things that are grown there. Because in this area, they were, especially during the times of Scripture, Israel was known for being the place where you could get the richest of fruits, right? Pomegranates. They were known for their pomegranates. They were known for their dates. They were known for their figs. They were known for their olives. They were known for their almonds. In fact, when, when, um, when Herod wanted to make sure that he didn't lose his head, right? Because he, if you don't know the story, he backed the wrong people. He backed um, Mark Antony and, and Augustus I, right? So he's like, hmm, I might lose my head. You know what he did? He sent a bowl of dates to Caesar Augustus. He said, will you be my date? No, he didn't. He said, please don't cut off my head, right? 
Why does he do that? Because Israel is known, Judea is known as the place that has rich, rich fruits. That's what they were known for. And then the Romans came through and destroyed the temple. And they went through on the Mount of Olives and cut down every tree, olive tree on the Mount of Olives and burned them all because of the fact that Israel had rebelled or Judea had rebelled. And so as part of that, then there was some cost to the agriculture, and then there were some famines and stuff. Anyways, after it all is said and done, in the 1940s and 50s, there were no date trees in all of Israel. And in the mid-1950s, he tells us about this, and so I had to do research, because that's what I do. You say something, I'm going to read about it, okay? In the 1950s, the Mossad, which is the Israeli Institute for Special Operations, the Mossad, the the Israeli CIA did a covert operation where they posed as buyers from France and they went to all of the surrounding countries that were known for having the best dates and date trees in the world. So Jordan, Iraq, I mean, these, they posed. Nobody wanted to sell to Israel, of course, because nobody likes Israel in that area. They're surrounded by people who do not like them, right? So... They posed as if they were from France, met them in Morocco, pretended to be French, and they bought 75,000 shoots of, of date trees, right? And so then they said, oh, we're going to just ship these back to France. And they put it on a ship that was going to France. In the middle of the Mediterranean then, some pirates boarded the ship. <laughs> didn't kill anybody, didn't hurt anybody. And after they were gone, the only thing that was missing was the date tree shoots. And he said, that field right there is the very first place where they planted those date trees. And to this day now, Israel is known as the greatest producer of dates in the world. 70% of medjool dates come or came from Israel. Since that time, China, he told us, and India have gone and stolen their dates um, and have started their own industry as a result, everywhere you go, you see trees and, 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 and like uh, uh, just whole fields full of date trees just like this. And these trees grow to 100 foot tall. Palm trees are known and thought of as a symbol of victory, right? The branches would be twisted into crowns for the Greeks when they were the ones who won the athletic contest. They would have a palm branch as a crown. When Jesus is going into Jerusalem, what do they throw on the ground? They throw palm branches. Why? Because it's a sign of victory. That's what this tree symbolizes because of the just sheer beauty and majesty of it. That's the date palm that this is talking about. And then when it says the cedars in Lebanon... The cedars are some of the oldest trees in the world. And specifically, the cedar in Lebanon is well known. I mean, the scientific phrase or title of the tree that is a cedar in Lebanon is called the cedar of Lebanon in Latin. In fact, it's not just in Lebanon. Lebanon is just to the north of Israel, but it's in other surrounding countries at this point as well. But they still have massive forests of the cedar tree. And these trees can grow to be 800 years old. And they are majestic trees. The most majestic tree in the Middle East is the cedar in Lebanon. On the Lebanese flag, there is a cedar tree because they are known for it. And when Solomon is building the temple, what wood would he use but the cedars of Lebanon? What this passage says is, you are, you are like the date palm tree, the righteous flourish like that, and they grow like a cedar in Lebanon with majesty, with beauty, with victory. That is who the righteous are, and here's how it happens. They are planted in the house of the Lord they flourish in the courts of our God. Where are they planted? 
in the house of the Lord? Where do they flourish? In the courts of our God. That word planted there is actually only used in this exact way one place in scripture right here. And it's not just planted, it's like transplanted. It's like they were taken from the place that they belonged and they were put in a place where maybe they didn't belong at first, but they were made to belong. And that is each and every one of our story. We do not belong a part of the people of God. But because of Jesus Christ, we have been grafted in and we are now a part of the people of God. That is our story. And that's exactly what this says here. They were transplanted into the house of the Lord. But there's a big difference between planted and attending. There's a big difference between those two. Um, You know, my... My story is that when I accepted Jesus Christ 23 years ago, 23 years ago, led to the Lord by somebody who attended praise, I moved to Springfield, Missouri, and I began attending praise. And as a result, I've been planted in this one place. And I have not gone to another church as a believer as part of my attendance. Like it's not been, I've been a part of another church. This is it for me. And that's not everybody's story. I'm not saying that it is, but I want to point out the difference between that and a friend of mine was telling me a few years back about some of their friends. They had been a part of praise since before I accepted Christ. And they said, you know, it's really interesting because what happens is with our other friends is that A lot of times they start attending one church when they were young, right? So so maybe they attended a church when they were kids. And then when they became young adults, they really wanted a church that spoke specifically to young adults. And then they got married. They were looking for a church with other young marrieds. And then they had kids. And they really needed a church that had a great kids program. And then they got to have teenagers, And that has challenges in and of itself. So then they're looking for a church that has a great youth program. And then they became empty nesters. And they were looking for a church that wasn't so focused on young families. And then they became retirees. And over and over and over again, they found a church that fit just their needs in just that phase of life. And this person said to me, when I look at that, some of them were going through some difficult things. And they said, our situation is totally different. And I've watched as they've moved from church to church. And now I say, nobody knows them. They are not known. And they do not know others. Because they did not get one place and plant I believe, maybe it's foolish, maybe it's naive, but I believe each generation should minister to the generation that is following them. I dream of a day, I dream of a day when the volunteers in the nursery are empty nesters, not young moms. Why? Because each generation has something to offer for those who are in the phase of life that they have just left. You want to know when the biggest kind of exodus from a church happens as people transition from one phase of life to the next. But if you want to be known and if you want to know, you have to be planted. There is a fundamentally different experience For somebody who is in praise and a part of praise and having invested in praise. See, people come and they consume and then they expect that they are known. But they have not been a part. What does planted versus attending look like? Well, it looks like getting on board with what is happening in that church. And for us, like a big part of that is your circle. When we talk about your circle at praise, if you haven't been a part of praise, what we are talking about is your circle of influence 
that God has very specifically put around you people that you are called to minister to. And our job is to make sure that you are equipped to do that, that you can be regularly investing in those relationships in order to share Jesus Christ with him. That's a part of who we are as a church, and that's going to come up more and more and more. And if you are not a part of that or or see that vision or want to be, then boy, you're missing out because this is talking about that type of involvement where you plant somewhere and say, that's my church. Not because when you attend, it's at an arm's length, right? It's like somebody else's church and you just go to it. But when you're planted in the church, you belong to that church and that church belongs to you. It's a totally different thing. Totally different thing. It looks like When the church says, man, this is unconventional, but we have been given this incredible property and we want to be a blessing to our community, whether you 100% are in agreement with it or not, that you move along with them and you say, "I'm, I'm with you here. This is the church that I am planted in and I will plant here. What happens for people like that? They flourish. They flourish. I have flourished at praise. And my journey is not everybody's, but be somewhere where you can plant and flourish so that when you go through something, you don't need the pastor to tell everybody because everybody already knows. That's what happens when you're in, when you're planted in a church. Verse 14, they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. How about that promise? The older I get, that promise sounds better and better and better. They still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. The date palm tree grows to 100 years old and produces fruit right till the end. And you know, if you've ever seen the fruit that a date palm tree produces, there's a ton of it. And incredible, I mean, it's just overwhelming. Google date palm tree fruit, and you'll see what I'm talking about. You'll see how there's so much more than you would expect there to be under this little palm tree or this growing palm tree. 100 years old. The cedars of Lebanon, 800 years old. And they produce pine cones, which can procreate right until the end. 800 years. And this says they still bear fruit in old age. They are ever full of sap and green. What a promise it is that you can still be green when you're old enough to go gray. What a promise that is, that this can be you if you plant somewhere and are flourishing there, that this is for you, that you can bear fruit in old age and be ever full of sap and green. When I first moved to Springfield, I was 19 years old, and I knew everything. (laughs) And I remember the old guys, the old guys, when I got to praise, the old guys, people like Joe Sardo. (laughs) I'm not kidding. He was the old guy. And Phil Ferrand, and Tim Strathy. For whatever reason, these old guys decided to pour their lives into 19-year-olds. <laughs> this last year, I realized that I am now the age that Joe Sardo was when I met him. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit convicted me and said, how are you pouring into 19-year-olds like Joe Sardo did? This is our calling, each generation to the next. What kind of fruit do you bear? That's the kind of fruit you bear. It's taking those who are going through what you have been through and pouring into them, making a difference in their lives. This is what it looks like to bear fruit in old age and ever be full of sap and green. 
verse 15, to declare that the Lord is upright. He is my rock, and there is no unrighteousness in him. <laughs> Kids, I've been at this thing for 23 years. I'm 41 or 42. Liz will tell me after service. <laughs> Can never remember, but the Lord is upright. He is my rock. In him there is no imperfection whatsoever. And if you find in Christ what I have found at a young age, you will spare yourself all kinds of difficulty. Who do you think that they are declaring this to? To declare that the Lord is upright, he is my rock, there is no unrighteousness in him. Well, Psalm 145 tells us, we declare his works to the next generation. That's where we declare his works. You declare this to those who are following the path that you've walked. This is the promise for those who plant that they will flourish and they will bear fruit and they will have sap and be green even when their hair is gray. And they will leave behind them a legacy for those who come next. This is the promise for those who plant in the house of the Lord. A couple of months ago, I realized I had to cut down a tree at my house. And it was a big tree. I didn't want to do it. It's like a 60 to 70 foot sycamore. I mean, had some years under its belt. But um, a couple of decades ago, a drunk driver didn't make the turn. And this happens often at our house, actually. I don't know why there's so many. Two decades ago, they slammed into this tree and caused damage to it. And over time, that damage turned into rot, which hollowed that tree out. And so my father-in-law was walking by it, and he said, because it was down at the corner of my property, right, right on the road, right up against the other side, right next to my father-in-law and mother-in-law on the other side, on this side. It's right at the corner. And he said, man, you're going to have to cut that tree down because sooner or later it's going to go. All it needs is a good storm and that thing's going to go over. So I went down there and I took a look at it and he was right. It was in pretty rough shape. So I did what everybody at Praise does when they're in that situation. I called Justin Harris and I said, hey, Justin, I need to cut a tree down at my house. Can you come and show me? Now, don't get me wrong. I can cut a tree down and drop it on a trailer all by myself without even a bit of help. <laughs> right where I want it to go. Don't need a bit of help. But every now and then, it's good to have a little help, I suppose. Right, Michael? Good to have help. So I called Justin Harris. Because if it fell one way, we'd be in trouble. If it fell the other way, we'd be in trouble. It had one way that this thing had to fall. So I said, good to have a second set of eyes and come up with a good plan. So we cut this tree down. Got it to fall exactly where it needed to fall. Because, I mean, you know, it's what we do. And uh, I'll never forget... When that tree hit the ground, what happened? I've gone back and I've looked at it a couple times since just to make sure that how I remember it is actually how it happened. When that tree hit the ground, it shattered. Shattered. I didn't know it, but it wasn't just hollow down here. That hollowness had worked its way up all the way through that entire tree, all the way up probably 30 feet was completely hollowed out. When we cut into it, it was holding on by literally an inch on either side. And this tree was this big around. I mean, it was a big tree held up by an inch. A bit of trauma grew into rot and hollowed the thing out. Now here's what's interesting. Right next to that sycamore was another sycamore. Same height. And when that car hit one, it hit the other. 
And you could see on the outside of both trees exactly where it was hit. And the trauma looked exactly the same. Same type of damage, same height, same width, everything. And yet this tree, where this one got rotted and hollowed out on the inside, the other one recovered and somehow survived. You can still see the scars, but the same trauma to both trees had different impacts. And that is the difference between somebody who is planted and pulling and somebody who is not. Because the same trauma can hollow somebody out. And when it comes down, it shatters. And for someone else who continues to pull and life-giving, that there's still scars there, but the exact same trauma on two can have a totally different impact. And that's the difference between somebody who is planted and somebody who is not. There will be things that happen in your life And you want to be in a place where you are rooted and pulling and known and you know. Because then there will be people around you that are a part of it with you. So be planted. Don't just attend praise. Be planted. Be a part. You've heard it said that you don't go to church. You are the church. But I say to you, you cannot be the church without the church. You cannot be the church without the rest of the church. And the best time to get planted into a church was five years ago. The second best time is today. To say, you know what? I'm not going to just attend I'm going to be a part. I'm going to belong. I'm going to invest. I'm going to be invested in. I'm going to plant here, and I'm going to join with what is happening. There's a totally different thing between those who attend and those who are planted. And if it's not a praise, man, that would make me sad. But be somewhere where you can plant, belong, and have the church belong. Because God's moved, right? He's moved in your life. Now it's your move. What will your response be? Soon as Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus, for the very first time, takes that word, the called out ones, the ecclesia, and applies it to you and me. The very first time, as soon as Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of God, he starts talking about the church. Why? Because the moment you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your next response should be, where can I get planted? And not every church is going to be perfect. Not every church or every scene or every phase or everything that happens at praise is going to be exactly what you want them to be. And that's okay. But do you want to know where the best place to make change is? From the inside out. Get inside, be a part, and make it better. It's your move.